Welcome to the Mondo Weiss Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Reed. At Mondo Weiss, we cover the movements, activists, and policymakers who affect the struggle for freedom in Palestine. Before we get into this episode, I wanted to let you know about a new email newsletter we launched this month called the Palestine Letter. Twice a month, our Palestine-based correspondents, Yumna Patel and Tara Kajaj, will share their behind-the-scenes insight into what it's like for journalists covering Israeli apartheid. It's sort of like a peek into their reporter's notebooks. In the first two issues, Tarek describes life in Gaza when the winter weather turns cold and electricity isn't available. And Yumna wrote about how it's not enough for journalists to be technically truthful in their coverage. To sign up for this twice-a-month newsletter, visit our website at mondoweiss.net slash Palestine Letter. In this episode, Mondo Weiss executive editor Adam Horowitz speaks to Lana Tatur about the recent report from Amnesty International declaring that Israel practices apartheid in order to oppress and dominate Palestinians. Earlier this month, Amnesty International became the latest human rights organization to accuse Israel of apartheid when it released a report describing Israel's oppression of the Palestinian people as, quote, a cruel system of domination and a crime against humanity, end quote. In the report, Amnesty outlines how Israel enforces a system of oppression and domination against the Palestinian people wherever it has control over their rights. In addition, the organization calls on the ICC to consider the crime of Israeli apartheid and for states to exercise universal jurisdiction to bring perpetrators of apartheid crimes to justice. The report, like those before it, has been hailed by advocates as a breakthrough, and yet there have been critics of it in the Palestine movement who have focused on the limitations of the apartheid framework. Today, I am lucky to speak with one of those critics, Lana Tatur, who has been writing on the question of why calling Israel an apartheid state is not enough. Lana Tatur is an assistant professor in global development at the School of Social Science at the University of New South Wales, Australia. She's currently completing a book provisionally titled Ambivalent Resistance, Palestinians in Israel in the Liberal Politics of Settler Colonialism and Human Rights. Welcome, Lana. Thank you for having me. Great. We're so excited. I'm so excited for this conversation. Same okay. here. Well, the Amnesty Report makes clear that the apartheid system it describes pertains to all Palestinians under Israeli control, including Palestinians with Israeli citizenship. Um, These Palestinians are sometimes referred to as Palestinian citizens of Israel or 48 Palestinians. And you you recently wrote in Middle East Eye that, in fact, quote, the focus on institutionalized discrimination against 48 Palestinians in the recent amnesty report reveals the limits of the apartheid framework. Can you explain that? Absolutely. Um, I think it's also important to mention that um, the Amnesty Report includes uh, all Palestinians under Israeli control, but it also includes uh, Palestinian refugees, which is really significant uh, um, addition to the conversation. And it follows a report from 2017 by Richard Falk and Virginia Tilly. Uh, and that is a significant uh, uh, addition in this report. Um, as to Palestinian citizens of Israel, this is really also a significant um, um, determination that Amnesty made. And in that, it follows uh, the reports by uh, B'Tselem and Human Rights Watch. Um But the problem with the ways in which uh, these organizations, and Amnesty included, Um, address the issue of apartheid and read apartheid is through the focus on institutionalized discrimination and racial domination. And Amnesty Report explicitly speaks of an intent uh, to to dominate uh, also the Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, And the problem with the focus on institutionalized discrimination and racial discrimination is that it overlooks the question of colonial domination and it overlooks settler colonialism as the condition that actually Palestinians in Israel 
48 Palestinians, regardless of their Israeli citizenship, face. And what they do face is Israeli settler colonialism. It is Zionist settler colonialism. Uh, and apartheid is part of the Israeli and Zionist settler colonialism in Palestine. It is a way, it is, a, if you like, it is a mode through which Israel advances um, uh, settler colonialism in Palestine. It works in the service of settler colonialism in Palestine, just like the occupation works in the service of settler colonialism in uh, the 67 occupied territories, the West Bank and Gaza. Yeah, and so then what would you say is lost when we focus on, because, I mean, as I said in the introduction, you know, in a lot of ways it feels as though this, you know, this apartheid framework feels very radical, at least in the in the U.S. discourse in many ways. And yet, I guess what I hear you saying is it is not, it's more a symptom than a, a core issue. And so I guess what would you say is lost when we don't discuss settler colonialism, when we're, when we're only talking about apartheid or only talking about occupation? There are a number of things that we are losing. First of all, we don't understand, we're, we're not diagnosing uh, the situation in Palestine properly. Uh, for those of us who care about understanding the question of Palestine, and understanding how we can work uh, uh, towards advancing the cause of Palestine, right? Freedom, liberation. Uh, um, understanding what we're facing is essential. And what we're facing is inherently settler colonialism. When we say we only face apartheid and we de-link apartheid from settler colonialism, it reflects a refusal to... Uh, uh, <laughs> to acknowledge what Israel and what Zionism are really about. And this is what we are facing. Uh, the second issue that we are uh, losing here is um, certainly in relation to 48 Palestinians is the question of citizenship, right? Because, because they are, it's a community that is defined by its Israeli citizenship in many ways, whether uh, we like it or not, right? Um, and uh, one of the, and this is something that I wrote also for the Middle East I, is that when we uh, uh, fail to acknowledge settler colonialism, you know, as, as the structure that they are facing, what we fail also to see is citizenship, not merely as a liberal framework or as something that is not fully accomplished, mm -hmm. but rather... Uh, 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 how citizenship also works to advance how colonial how colonial sorry how citizenship is inherently a colonial structure that works to advance colonial domination and part of that colonial domination is also racial domination. So again, we are also not reading. Uh, uh, what Palestinians in Israel are facing, and we're not reading their legal status, their citizenship, and what it means correctly, and how it operates within that regime, and what political ends it advances, and it does advance colonial domination above all, of which, again, racial domination and institutionalized discrimination are part. Uh, they're part of advancing the elimination of Palestinians. And we see that and the dispossession of their land. And we see that time and again uh, in all of historic uh, uh, Palestine. The third thing that we are missing when we don't talk about uh, uh, settler colonialism is decolonization. So if we talk about apartheid as disassociated from settler colonialism, First of all, we don't understand what, why is the apartheid there, right? Mm -hmm. What is it serving? But also, when we want to look at, um, and this is an intervention that also Soher Assad, a Palestinian human rights activist, made. Um, she talked about, you know, when the amnesty report came out, she said, amnesty are talking about dismantling apartheid. 
But what is dismantling apartheid without dismantling settler colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and this is really a significant point because decolonization, if we don't talk about colonialism, we don't do talk about decolonization, which brings me to the next point, which is if we don't talk about decolonization, then what we have is what I call a liberal reading of apartheid, right? We understand apartheid, again, as something that is unconnected from the colonial condition in Palestine, and we understand it, understanding as Uh, related to um, systematic discrimination. Um, and we understand it in terms of equality and inequality. So we understand it in liberal terms. We read apartheid, even though it's it is seemingly a radical claim to make, right? That, you know, the condition in Palestine is apartheid. And Palestinians have been making this claim you know, repeatedly and constantly for decades now. And we are very happy to see um, uh, the international human rights community catching up with, with what we're saying. But there is there's something that is really important to, um, to notice here. The reading that they are offering of apartheid is different from the reading of apartheid that Palestinians have traditionally um and historically advanced. And that is a reading of apartheid that is entwined with speaking about imperialism, colonialism, mm -hmm. uh, um, and racism in Palestine. Uh, it's never, and speaking of Zionism, and we'll come back to that later. Um, so uh, the reading, we have here kind of two readings of apartheid, We're all using the same label, but we mean by it different things. And these organizations read it through the liberal prism of discrimination on equality, which means that if we speak about what is next for Palestine, dismantling apartheid for them can coexist within the state of Israel through the extension of equality of citizenship to Palestinians under you know, to all Palestinian under its control. Uh, and that is not decolonization. Decolonization is a different process that requires you to dismantle the colonial structures. And dismantling, dismantling settler colonialism cannot happen merely through, uh, uh, through liberal concepts, through liberal agenda. And, and, And to say, look, equality won't happen in Palestine without dismantling settler colonialism. Uh, uh, but within the liberal prism, the mere extension of citizenship, for example, uh, uh, could qualify as you know, a step to dismantling Israeli apartheid. Um, and what we want is dismantling settler, you know, the settler colonial project of Palestine. Uh, which part of it would be obviously dismantling the apartheid that serves it, the racial hierarchies that are enshrined in the political system, the legal system, the economic system, and so on and so forth. Yeah, wow. Um, there's a lot to unpack there, and thank you so much for that. Um, I guess one, and I don't know if we'll get into too much of re re reiterating what you just shared, but I mean, so one of my questions is, I mean, you referred to that it's not just settler colonialism, it is Zionist settler colonialism. Um, and yet, you know, you read the amnesty report, the word Zionism is not in that report once. Um, you look at the Human Rights Watch uh, apartheid report, and they, they the word Zionism or Zionist appears once in passing, referring to a road name in the Galilee. Um, and I'm just wondering... And it seems to extend from what you were saying in terms of maybe this liberal conception of apartheid, but uh, I'm wondering if you can explain why it's meaningful that they don't talk about Zionism. Why it's meaningful? Um, you know, can we talk about the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States without talking about uh, uh, white supremacy? We need to talk about the ideology that 
makes apartheid in Palestine, right? That that is behind, that drives the apartheid regime, that drives the settler colonial uh, uh, project in Palestine. Um, and again, that goes back. It's it's similar to settler colonialism, right? We need to understand what we're facing, and saying uh, uh, ignoring settler colonialism is one, and ignoring uh, Zionism is the second. And just as a side note, you know, uh, the settler colonial framework has really become dominant in in critical circles uh, on Palestine, you know, in academia and in the activist circles. Um, and I have often, uh, uh, um, I often encounter um, a focus on settler colonialism and an acknowledgement of the settler colonial condition in Palestine, which doesn't which doesn't exist in these reports, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the other discourses, without acknowledging Zionism, so speaking about settler colonialism as well, without talking about Zionism, so uh, the refusal to reckon with Zionism and to, you know, pinpoint explicitly and clearly Zionism as a racial and racist framework and ideology uh, um, that, you know, that drives these projects in Palestine is really significant. It doesn't exist in these reports and often it doesn't exist, um, not often, but sometimes it doesn't exist uh in accounts of settler colonialism in Palestine. So we can't talk about apartheid and we can't talk about settler colonialism without talking about Zionism and without bringing the race uh, uh, the racial question and the politics of race um, uh, into the conversation. How can we have a system that creates one, you know, one group dominating another group and read this domination outside of the politics of, of race and how the politics of race is, you know, how the ra- this politics of race is closely linked and intertwined with settler colonialism. There is no colonialism without, you know, without race, without racism, without creating um, uh, without rationalizing the Palestinians, without this rationalization of the Palestinian is what makes Palestinians eliminatory. Mm-hmm. It is it is what, um, and we see it everywhere. We see it in the ways in which the, you know, the Israeli settler colonial project works, but also this is what stands this kind of anti-Palestinian racism and the racial politics of settler colonialism is also what stands in the ways in which the West is backing up uh, um, the Israeli state where Palestinians are the collateral damage mm. constantly uh, of the Zionist project. And that is considered an acceptable, uh, uh, we need to pay you know, the price for Israel's existence. And, and that's part of the politics of race. And we, when we don't talk about Zionism, when we don't talk about the ideology, again, we are missing what we are facing. Uh, and again, we are going against Palestinian reading of, of the situation that they are facing. Um, and in this respect, you know, we can talk about resolution 3379, which declared uh, Zionism as racism. And, uh, you know, I have no doubt that for many liberals um, that would accept the amnesty report and the human rights report and B'Tselem report, including these organizations themselves, will refuse to stand behind a claim that Zionism is racism. They Mm. will refuse to pinpoint Zionism. This is a red flag. And in fact, Amnesty clearly uh, uh, stated that, you know, it has no issues with uh, Israel being a Jewish state, which, you know, it's again... (laughs) This is the core of apartheid. Uh, so you don't have a pro- so you have a problem with you know with apartheid, but you don't have a problem with Israel as a Jewish state. 
And this is why Palestinians continue insisting on, you know, clearly articulating settler, you know, settler colonialism and Zionism uh, um, in relation to um in relation to race, in relation and as settler colonialism and pushing the discourse forward. Uh, they did catch up with us eventually on the <laughs> apartheid. Uh, so we are pushing. They might, you know, it might take another 50 years and they'll catch up with this. Uh, But, you know, it's too long. <laughs> it's too long. Well, I want to... Um... We'll continue in this vein, but bring in actually some more of your writing, which I think might help sort of complicate and clarify some of what we've already discussed. Um, and turning back to, you know, Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, um, you touched on many of the themes that we've been discussing in a great article that you wrote for the Journal of Palestine Studies. Uh, it was published this last November, and we'll link to it in the show notes for the show so everyone can read it. And it was on the Unity Intifada um, and looks at the history of 48 Palestinians and what you call, and I'm going to quote you, the tension between liberal and decolonial agendas, end quote, in that community. I'm, I'm wondering, I feel like that's some of the tension that we've been talking about um, already in this conversation, but I'm wondering if you can explain this tension as it, as it exists within um, the Palestinian community in Israel and what the, what its ongoing relevance, what are the, the relevance of that tension is today? Um, I think that the 48 Palestinians are really important group through which to unpack you know, that tension between the liberal and the decolonial or the anti-colonial. Um, and the reason is, you know, it, it's a group that is in many ways uh, unique among Palestinians in that it, in, it, you know, Palestinians, 48 Palestinians hold Israeli citizenship. And in many ways that steered the struggle of 48 Palestinians in a different direction uh, for many years. Um, and it still does. Uh, so the, you know, the struggle for equal citizenship, the struggle to transform Israel from um, a Jewish state to a state of uh, all its citizens, um, a struggle for recognition um, as a national minority, uh, an indigenous minority within the Israeli state. Um, so in many ways, the 48 Palestinians have kind of run the gamut of the liberal options, right? Mm -hmm. From your kind of a, a classic uh, liberal equality, civil rights discourse to a more liberal multicultural option, to the politics of recognition, um, and so on and so forth. So we are, in a way, and I am part of this community, right? Uh, we are the perfect, you know, a, a test case um, for the liberal options. And looking at these liberal options, I think it is safe to say that, you know, they failed. And part of the reasons they failed is again because in devising this kind of liberal politics um, and liberal struggle that we did and um, um, refining it, changing it, re-articulating it, but still within that framework, we abandoned in many ways decolonization mm. uh, as the way forward. True, we can read the quest to transform Israel from a Jewish state to a uh, state of all its citizens as, you know, as, as kind of decolonial or decolonizing. Uh, um, but here I'm reading really decolonization in a much more radical way, right? Decolonization that is not about transformation, but about the dismantling mm -hmm. of uh, settler colonialism in, in, in Palestine and also as a project that brings all Palestinians uh, um, and resists the fragmentation of Palestinians under one project uh, of liberation. Um, 
But on the other hand, if you look at the history of 48 Palestinians, and this is something I tried to do in that piece, you can see that there were always these challenges from within of 48 uh, activists and groups that have tried to offer a more radical, um, kind of a more radical agenda for the struggle of 48 Palestinians by linking it directly to the struggle you know, of Palestinians in, uh, in the 67 territories and bringing, you know, the question of refugees and the right of return of refugees and insisting that the Palestinian people are, you know, the Palestinian cause is indivisible um, and trying to uh, um, uh, come under one umbrella uh, to articulate their struggle. Um, and they always been pushing. They have been pushing, you know, in the mid '60s with um, mid end of '60s with uh, El Arab movement, and then they were pushing in the '70s with the rise of the student movement, um, and um, also the emergence of Abna El Balad, the Sons of the Village movement, a radical leftist movement. And it continues with the unity and tifada and this new generation of activists that is really saying, you know what, we don't want to transform Israel. We don't want to reform Israel. Uh, Israel. We want to dismantle uh, uh, the Israeli state. We want liberation. We don't want to immerse in Israeli politics. We don't want to be part of the Israeli political scene. This is not where we belong we belong in the in Palestinian politics, Palestinian radical uh, anti-colonial politics, and similar groups are emerging everywhere. Uh, not just in forty-eight Palestine, you see also the new generation and new activists and groups in, you know, in the West Bank and in Gaza, uh, 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 looking for the radical option again uh, um, for the Palestinian cause. Similar in the diaspora. And they're saying, you know, we're not part of the Israeli scene and we need to resist to be part of the Israeli scene. And our, our liberation is, is not dependent on Israeli citizenship. Our political future is not, uh, uh, the path to our political future does not run through our Israeli citizenship. It runs through the possibility of transcending that citizenship and it's, you know, that being, being an issue of the Israeli state to really being part of the question of Palestine, which we are. Um, and so they really offer a completely, and you know, a completely different vision to the political future of Palestinians in Israel. And they try to challenge and they have, you know, the road ahead is really complicated and they are facing a significant challenge because looking at the history of the political activism of 48 Palestinians, even though there was always the radical anti-colonial option, it was always contained by liberal politics. It was always suppressed and crushed by liberal politics. And it, these, you know, the new activists, the new generation of activists know that. They look back and they see that in land day and they look back and they see the, you know, the promise that was in October 2000 when Palestinians in Israel, again, 48ers, you know, joined the Palestinian uprising and they didn't join as citizens. They joined as Palestinians and then it was contained and, you know, uh, Meshed Kayal writes about it through the OR Commission, the official Israeli mm -hmm. Inquiry Commission, um, and again, uh, uh, seeking to, you know, uh, frame Palestinians as separate from other, 48ers as separate from other Palestinians, because, you know, the Israeli state depends on the fragmentation of the Palestinian people. Uh, and they come with the manifesto of, you know, hope, dignity and hope. And really their, uh, their articulation of, of the way forward is all Palestinian, right? And, you know, they, they're right. And I do want to quote from that. I know I've been uh, uh, speaking for long, but I think it's important. 
They're saying these days we are writing a new chapter, a chapter of a united intifada that aspires to one and only one goal, the reunification of Palestinian society in all components and aspects of life, the reunification of the political will and means of struggle in the face of Zionism in all of Palestine. Um, and this is this is really significant. And whether they'll succeed in pushing forward uh, uh, is, you know, it, it, it's in question mark. But there is no doubt that there is a significant transformation happening in the politics in, of 48 years. And I think it's really important that we all look at this example, especially those who are seduced by the liberal reading of apartheid and that are seduced by, you know, that idea of let's all claim citizenship under the Israeli, you know, under the Israeli state and then things will change. We need to talk about decolonization. We need to talk about liberation. We need to learn from this example because this example is precisely what exemplifies the limits of the liberal frameworks, but also the limits of liberal reading of apartheid. No, thank you for that. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, one of the things that I I wonder, I mean, we have listeners and readers um, sort of all over the world. Some are in Palestine, but many are in the United States and in other places. And, you know, from my perspective here, uh, it's easy to see where the leaders of this liberal agenda are and what their outlets are and how they're how they're you know getting their word out but i'm I'm wondering if you can say some more of you know where the the this decolonial agenda is being um set or is it still very much like a very sort of internal discussion or are there places for those of us outside of Palestine who want to follow this thinking and follow this debate and want to support it, um, you know, ways that we could do that or places that we could be looking for that. Um, I think that for, sorry, I love, I, I had, um, you wanted to start with something and I forgot with what. <laughs> sure. I mean, I was, uh, can, can can you start it again? It might of course. spark it. Yes, yes. So, um, so, I mean, looking more broadly within Palestine, it is very clear, you know, who the leaders of this liberal agenda. Oh, are. where where it comes from? Okay, I wanted to start in, in there. the occupied territories. Yeah. Now, um, now, now I, I, yeah. Now I'm 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 back on, in focus. Sure. Okay, got but it. I'm, just, I'm I'm wondering where is the this the decolonial agenda being. Um, yeah. de- you know, de- determined. And who who are the who are the leaders of this uh, this decolonial movement? Um, you know, this kind of decolonial or anti-colonial movement um, has a long history uh, mm-hmm. uh, in the Palestinian struggle, so it's not new. Um, and we have our own kind of, you know, Palestinian intellectual uh, and activist history uh, to draw on uh, when speaking about anti-colonialism uh, in the Palestinian context. And I always go back there to see, you know, how they were writing and what they were saying and how they were understanding Palestine. Um, and I learn a lot from there. Um and I think we can't, you know, this is part of the repertoire that we have um, as Palestinians um, to draw on. And, you know, in our contemporary, in these days, uh, the anti-colonial or the decolonial agenda is really grassroots. Um and we need to look at grassroots movements and on activists uh, to get the cues, you know, for where this agenda is. It's certainly not coming from uh, from the PA, from the Palestinian mm-hmm. Authority. Um, 
not even, you know, to an extent, not even Hamas, you know, and, and this is, again, a sad story in its own right. And also, you can't really find it within the Palestinian political parties in Israel that run to the Knesset. Uh, you know, they might be critical, and they, many of them are critical, um, but the anti-colonial agenda is not growing there. It is growing in the grassroots. It is in the protests. Uh, the unity on Intifada really brought it, um, brought it to the fore. You could see um, uh, Palestinian organizing being young and being, um, being, you know, in the streets protesting, confronting Israeli forces. Um, you could see the new voices, you know, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, really leading um, um, kind of, you know, the discourse on what is happening, framing the events, framing the agenda. Um, Hamad al Kurd is one example, but there are so many others. And together, it did create an anti-colonial voice, right? Uh, uh, whether in action, whether in whether academically, um, you know, in the writing, in framing the events, we can see that in, you know, the writings that have appeared in different outlets, including yours. Um, and so it is there, and it is there, and it is everywhere, uh, and it is accessible. Um, and I think it is also fair to say it is dominant, right? Even if it is not the hegemonic, it is very much dominant. And it plays against, you know, that kind of reactionary politics um, that is, you know, the local Palestinian reactionary politics that is holding the Palestinian struggle back. We saw that with the Palestinian Authority and its suppression of um, Palestinian activists and, you know, arrests and torture and the assassination of uh, Banat. And uh, we're seeing, that, seeing it in 48 as well in a different way, right? It has different manifestation um, with... Palestinian political parties, you know, one of them has joined uh, uh, the existing coalition, but the others who are very critical of the Israeli state and the Israeli regime uh, um, still find these movements and these voices more threatening than enabling. So there is a, there is a clear clash there. Um, but I think it is still safe to say that Palestinian radical activism on the ground is becoming very dominant and that the anti-colonial framework is gaining more and more supporters um, all across. And we see also solidarity activists really paying attention uh, to this discourse and asking themselves, you know, uh, listening and also asking themselves what they can uh, do and how they can you know, bridge the gap between the different discourses that they are exposed to. Yeah. And and that actually really just leads into my last question, which is, you know, many of our listeners are activists and advocates uh, for Palestine. And I'm wondering what you feel like their takeaway from this discussion should be. Um, what, how does this conversation, uh, how should it impact their work? Um, and what is their their charge or what is their mission coming away from this discussion about uh, the limits of, uh, of a certain type of apartheid framework and this more liberal understanding? Look, I think that for many of those who are doing solidarity work, uh, the reports of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty and, you know, the changing discourse on Palestine um, you know, the, the fact that apartheid is now a word that we say in relation to Palestine um, is significant. And I don't want to downplay it. It is significant. And I think that for those of us who are doing advocacy, 
also kind of tactically, we use these reports. Also, if we don't always agree with their framing or, but we use them. Um, when I do interviews, I don't know, for ABC in Australia, I use these reports, even though I'm very critical of them, but I use them tactically. So I don't want to downplay it. It is significant. Um, but I do think that we need to be very careful not to let them dominate the discourse on Palestine. The agenda needs to be set by Palestinians on the ground, by Palestinians, by Palestinian activists. It needs to be Palestinian driven. Um, and we should really be wary of international law dominating the question and certainly of uh, liberal interpretations of international law. Um, we can use it strategically, tactically, um, but we need to be worried that it will um, become the dominant uh, um, discourse on Palestine and lead kind of take over and leading the political agenda of Palestinians and, you know, the interpretation of the question of Palestine. Um, in that sense, I think solidarity activists have responsibility. responsibility. As I said, the anti-colonial discourse is there. It's everywhere. Uh, so many Palestinian activists and allies and academics and you know, public figures are really putting it out there. It's there. Uh, you don't need to work hard to find it. You need to listen um, and to really allow yourself to be uh, led by Palestinian radical voice and constantly ask yourselves whether where your actions fit, in which framework do they fit. Mm -hmm. And whether the voice and the agenda that you are advancing is overriding Palestinian agenda. And we constantly see that. I get often, but, you know, what difference does it make if we say settler colonialism, if we say Zionism? You know, let's just, you know, get everyone citizenship and work from there. That would be the first step. Or, you know, why are you making it so hard? Um, and this is not helpful. I mean, listen and learn. And this is why I say, you know, 48 Palestinians are always excellent example as to why you need to listen and learn. Um, so don't override and be generous in the ways you engage. Center Palestinian voices, center Palestinian agenda. Um, and Use those reports, you know, wherever they're useful, but don't let them be the centerpiece of your solidarity activism, because solidarity is, you know, solidarity is about uh, um, following the oppressed in the way they understand their oppression and what they're facing. Um, so, yeah, listening and respecting and being generous. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. Uh, this was such a, a rich and thought-provoking discussion. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to our show, a production of MondoWeiss.net. The music is from Sound of Picture. Visit our site to sign up for free daily and weekly newsletters on Palestine, Israel, and related U.S. politics. If you're enjoying our podcast, please consider becoming a donor by visiting mondoweiss.net slash donate. Mondo Weiss is a nonprofit publication, and every donation of any amount helps sustain our work. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen, and please leave a rating and review to help other listeners find our show.